Hello, my name is Samuel Sinyangwe, co-founder of Campaign Zero. And today I'm going to tell a story about police violence in America. My story begins on August 9, 2014, when Mike Brown Jr. was shot and killed in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. His death sparked a wave of protests that has reverberated around this country to this day. There are people still protesting in St. Louis today. And in those early days and weeks and months of the protest movement, there was a national conversation that emerged around police violence and its causes, its underlying conditions, how it impacted communities, particularly communities of color. And all too often, those conversations were not grounded by data. And the reason for that is because the federal government, even to this day, does not collect comprehensive data on the number of people killed by police in this country. They could tell you how much rainfall there was in rural Kentucky going back centuries, but they couldn't tell you with any degree of accuracy how many people police killed in this country. And so we built the most comprehensive database of people killed by police to answer the questions that had emerged and that were continuing to be asked all around this country. We looked at crowdsourced data, local media reports, obituaries, criminal records databases, social media profiles, public records requests, and analyzed and synthesized and aggregated all of that data into one database called Mapping Police Violence. And then we figured out how to visualize that data and tell a data-driven story about what was happening in this country and how we could address this issue. And it started with this map. This map shows 964 people who were killed by police this year, in 2017. About three to four people every single day. And I show this map because in those early days, so many people uh, we're not convinced that this was a national crisis, that this, in fact, was nationwide in scope. They may have thought that there was something going on in St. Louis or there was something going on in Baltimore, but we used the data to show that, in fact, this was happening all over the country in many different communities and that it was impacting particular communities to a larger degree. So we looked at the data by race, and we found that black people were three times more likely to be killed by police than their white peers that Latinos were about 1.5 times more likely, Native Americans 1.5 times more likely uh, than white people to be killed by police per population. We also found that black and Latino people were more likely to be unarmed when killed by police. But we wanted to dive deeper into this data so we could better understand what was happening and start to come up with solutions. And so we broke the data down by city and by state and began to analyze uh, at a much more granular level what was happening. And we got this chart. We looked at the 100 largest cities in America and looked at the rates of people killed by police per capita. And we found that there was a huge level of variation. There were cities where police violence was incredibly severe, places like Orlando, Florida, or Oklahoma City, or St. Louis. Oklahoma City, one in six homicides is committed by police. St. Louis, a black man in St. Louis is two times more likely to be killed by police than the average American is to be killed by anyone, civilian or police. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there were cities where police were not killing people, places like Buffalo, New York, Plano, Texas, Irving, California. And we also wanted to understand some more dynamics about what was happening. So for people who are unarmed and killed by police, uh, what were some of the racial dynamics there? And so you can see uh, on the right side of this map, we looked at unarmed people killed by police since 2013. And we coded it by race. And so you can see the red and the orange are black and Latino people, uh, and the gray are white people. And what this graph shows so clearly and so plainly is that in major American cities, almost every unarmed person killed by police is a person of color, the majority of whom are black. This is a, a national crisis that is particularly and severely impacting communities of color. And all too often, when a police officer shoots and kills somebody, they are not held accountable by the criminal justice system. So in 97% of cases where an officer kills somebody, the officer is not charged with any crime. And in 99% of cases, the officer is not convicted of a crime. It even goes deeper than that. So when an officer is convicted of a crime, they get a lesser sentence than a civilian convicted of the same crime. In Georgia, an officer killed an unarmed black man and for the first time got a sentence that allowed him to serve jail time only on the weekends because he was a police officer. And it's important as I go over some of these numbers and statistics to recognize that they are not just numbers and statistics. They are lives, they are people. They are men like Walter Scott, women like Charlena Lyles, children like Tamir Rice. 
people with families and communities uh, that have been torn apart by this violence. So what do we do with this data? Now that we've collected it, we've collected an estimated 99% of the total number of people killed by police in this country since 2013. How can we use it to actually enact change, to lower the resistance to that change, and then to put in place evidence-based solutions to end police violence in this country? And it starts with debunking false narratives that all too often make it hard to push for change to happen in the first place. And one of those narratives is around crime. So whenever you hear a conversation about police violence, particularly when you hear, you know, if you're watching Fox News or if you are listening to police officials, you will hear an explanation that is grounded in crime rates. What they will say is that police are killing people at the high rates that I mentioned, uh, not because of anything the police are doing wrong, but because they're in dangerous situations, encountering dangerous, violent people, and having to use deadly force to defend themselves and others from harm. That's the narrative you hear. And it is an assumption that is made. There is no data to support that narrative that is presented in those conversations. And so we actually used the data that we collected to interrogate that narrative, to see if it was the truth. And what we found was that actually there's not a connection between violent crime rates in US cities and the rates of police violence in those same cities. There are cities with high levels of violent crime, like Newark and Detroit, that have comparatively low levels of police violence. And there are cities with lower levels of violent crime, like Orlando, Florida, that have much higher levels of police violence. So something else was explaining why police violence was happening in particular places. Just to bring this point home, compare Buffalo, New York with Orlando, Florida. Between 2013 and 2016, uh, both of those cities had similar populations, similar crime rates, similar demographics. But police in Orlando, Florida killed 15 people over that time period, and in Buffalo, New York, zero people were killed by police. So what was happening in Buffalo, New York that was going right, that we can learn from, that we can scale? And what was going wrong in Orlando, Florida that needed to change? And that brought us to a conversation about solutions. So we looked throughout our database, over 5,000 uh, records of people who have been killed by police since 2013. We looked at the initial reason for that incident that occurred. What was the reason that police were responding to that case? What happened during those encounters? What were the policies and practices of those police departments? And what role did they play in actually contributing to that situation, ending so violently? And that brought us to building a comprehensive policy platform at the local, state, and federal level called Campaign Zero a 10-point solutions plan to end police violence in this country. And it includes a number of things, but I'm going to go into a couple that are really, really important here. The first has to do with use of force policies of a police department. These are the policies that a city and a police department will set that authorize police to use a particular level of force in particular situations. And what we found was that these policies vary dramatically across police departments. There's no one uniform policy across departments. And so we looked at these policies. We did a public records request for the 100 largest cities in the country for their use of force policies. We got them back and we reviewed them in concert with lawyers and uh, uh, former US Department of Justice attorney and activists across the country, reviewing each of these policies to see what were the types of restrictions that they placed on how and when police could use force in particular situations. And so I'm gonna use two examples here to illustrate what that means. So contrast San Jose Police Department's use of force policy in California with Philadelphia Police Department. So San Jose Police Department use of force policy, I'm just gonna read uh, the policy word for word. Officers need not retreat or desist in the reasonable use of force. There is no requirement that officers use a lesser intrusive force option before progressing to a more intrusive one. That's the standard those officers are held accountable to. Compare that to Philadelphia. Retreating or repositioning is not a sign of weakness or cowardice by an officer. It is often the tactically superior police procedure rather than the immediate use of force. The use of deadly force is an extreme measure to only be employed in the most extreme situations after all lesser means of force have been exhausted. So, San Jose Police Department policy, officers need not retreat or desist. And there's no requirement to use a lesser intrusive means of force before progressing to a more severe one. Philadelphia, it's the exact opposite. They have to use the least intrusive measure, measure of force, and retreating, repositioning, de-escalated are actually prioritized as a standard for those police officers. 
So what does that mean? Do, th do those policies actually matter, right? Does that actually impact those rates of police violence that I showed? So we investigated that further. We looked at, for the 100 largest police departments in the country, uh, what those policies were, and we mapped them out in a grid. For eight different types of use of force policies, uh, things like requiring de-escalation, specifying the types of force that can be used in particular situations, banning things like chokeholds and strangleholds, requiring officers to exhaust all other reasonable means, like Philadelphia does, before pr progressing to deadly force, requiring officers to intervene if they see another officer using excessive force, restricting police shooting at moving vehicles, which we know often re results in a more dangerous situation because if you disable that driver, the vehicle then becomes a missile, and requiring officers to report and those reports to be investigated whenever a use of force is used. So, we matched that against the rates of police killings of those departments and found that each of those eight policies was associated in a lower rate of police uh, use of deadly force. So much so that police departments that required officers to exhaust all other reasonable means were 25% less likely to kill civilians in their jurisdiction. If they required de-escalation, 15% less likely to kill civilians under their jurisdiction. And when you combine these policies, the effects really are dramatic. A police department that adopts all eight of these policies when controlling for other factors like arrests and threats on officers and the demographics of a department and the level of inequality in a department, com controlling for all of those factors, departments that, are, that enact all eight of these policies were 72% less likely to kill civilians than departments that enacted none of them. So there are solutions here, evidence-based, data-driven solutions for how we can address this issue in our communities. And what's interesting about them is the departments that enact these solutions are actually safer for officers, too. So when you, when you try to move these policies in cities, what you will often hear from police unions uh, and people who are opposing them is that these types of measures endanger officers because they prevent officers from using all the tools and discretion at their disposal to defend themselves. But when you look at the data, it's actually safest for officers in these jurisdictions. So we can enact these. It's a win-win for officers and for civilians. And so, building on this platform, we have been advocating for change at every level of government, for local police departments to enact these policies within their administrative code, for cities to pass ordinances that support these policies, for states to move them into state law and enact them, for the federal government to use its funding streams to incentivize these types of solutions. We've been tracking legislation in every state, and what we found is that there's actually been some progress. 30 states have enacted a law that establishes at least one of these measures to address police violence that we've proposed through Campaign Zero. What's more, the federal government, under the previous administration, took, access, took action to limit militarization and to collect better data on this issue. Their database is going to adopt the same methodology that I articulated earlier, so that they can actually, for the first time, come up with a comprehensive federal accounting for people killed by police in this country. But it's only the beginning. In order to accelerate that change, it's going to take all of us to be involved in this work. Change isn't easy. Policy change, in particular, as we've seen in Congress, is hard. It takes thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to make an impact here. And so we've developed new tools and technology to make that process easier. For example, this widget that we developed, which allows you to put in your zip code, it shows you who your state and federal representatives are, what votes they've taken on police reform measures, and allows you to contact them and urge them to take action, all in three clicks or less. We've had almost 100,000 people use this tool to contact their representatives. But again, it's only the beginning. We recruited 33,000 people, volunteers from across the country, in two weeks who wanted to get involved. But it's still a fraction of those who could get involved in this work. Because there are 104 million Americans, according to Pew Research surveys, who support the Black Lives Matter movement. The majority of people in this country believe in justice and equity when you poll them. And that's new. That has actually changed in result and as a result of this protest movement, where it used to be a small proportion of the population, about 39 to 40 percent of the country, believed that more changes were needed in order to secure equal rights in this country for people of color. Now it's about 60 percent in only the space of a couple of years. So the question is, how do we mobilize over 100 million people in this work? What types of tools and technologies can we build to onboard people at scale in the process of advocating for change at every level of government? What if we engaged everyone in the work? It should be as easy as taking out your phone, saying, 
I'm in Brookings, I'm a lawyer, I have three hours a week. And it connects you immediately to a task that you can do right away that is the most strategically aligned to making impact in that area. Connects you to an organization that can support you in that work and to learnings that you can use to teach others about this issue. That's the type of work that we're doing. To, that's the type of tool and technology that we want to build. And so I invite you to join us in this effort to achieve a world and a vision in which black lives matter and which we've ended police violence once and for all. So thank you.